We're a little over an hour away from the Green Bay Packers and the San Francisco 49ers kicking off week nine of the 2020 NFL season. If they have any players left to play, that is. Is COVID-19 such a beautiful thing? We analyzed the film last week between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys, and we asked ourselves the question, is Carson Wentz still an elite quarterback capable of reaching that MVP status that he once has or he once was at in 2017? We're also at the midpoint of the regular season, and we ask ourselves the question, who are going to be the award winners at the end of the season? We give out our mid-season awards, such as Most Valuable Player, Offensive Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, and so much more on a new episode of Time to Football. Glad that you guys are joining us on this wonderful Thursday. I'm the host of this show, Hassan Khan. So we just put it out there, an advertisement on the Fantasy Football Starts and Sits video saying that, hey, we do this podcast every Thursday before the Sunday night or the Thursday night game as a way to kick off the NFL week that's ahead of us as a pregame show so you don't have to watch Fox's coverage of, of, of the pregame show or NFL Network's coverage of the Thursday night game. You can join us and interact with us live as we premiere this up on YouTube every 7 p.m. Thursday night chat with us on youtube i'm going to be joining you guys in the chat and ask any sort of questions that you guys have fantasy football if you have a a comment or a thought on anything that i talk about please leave your comments in the chat and i will be gladly interacting with you guys and answering any questions that you guys have but we talked about the uh topics that we wanted to cover before the thursday night game COVID 19 we I, i don't know if you guys saw this but san francisco 49ers the wide receivers it looks like Trent Taylor of the San Francisco 49ers is their number one wide receiver. That's no offense to Trent Taylor. Great player. Interviewed him. Great person as well. But, gosh, Brandon Ayuk is out. Debo Samuel has put on that COVID-19 list as well, even though he's has a hamstring injury. He was, wasn't going to play in this game anyways. And then with the running backs in Green Bay, Aaron Jones is dealing with an injury. You've got Jamal Williams out on that list as well. So you've got the likes of Tyler Irvin and Dexter Williams going to be leading the leading the charge for the Green Bay Packers here tonight. Cannot wait to watch that game and see what happens. I'll have that game open on my iPad as I watch the Bachelorette with my hot brunette wife here tonight. So uh, double, double header that we've got going on here on Thursday night. Whew, wonderful thing. Yes, honey, I, I I paid attention. Oh, gosh, look at that play. But before we get into the topics of today's show, we always have to give the most prestigious award on this show, and that is the Hungriest Player of the Week. Hungriest Player of the Week, the one that wanted it the most. My Hungriest Player of the Week, not the checkdowns, not the NFL's account. They stole that award from me. Just have to give my weekly uh, salty plug saying that I hate how the NFL stole this award from me. Anyways, my hungriest player of the week. We, it's pretty obvious at this point. The person, the player, the man that was the most dominant, that played like he wanted it the most, Dalvin Cook, Minnesota Vikings running back. I played against him in fantasy football. Such a shame. But Dalvin Cook, 226 total yards, four total touchdowns. Unlikely numbers to happen for any running back this whole entire season. Dalvin Cook probably had the best fantasy football performance out of anyone for the whole duration of the 2020 season. Put up close to, if you play in half PPR leagues, 47 fantasy points, which is completely dominant. Had that one long screen pass for going for a touchdown. Had touchdown after touchdown after touchdown in the ground. And it, it didn't matter about his groin injury at that point. He injured his groin in that game against the Seattle Seahawks. He was dominating dominating in that game. Put him aside, injured his groin, injured a muscle next to his family jewels, next to his uh, cock and balls. But it doesn't matter. Dalvin Cook, all of a sudden, healthy, good to go. Got the bulk of the load. 30 carries in that game. Played like he was hungry. And led the Minnesota Vikings to an upset victory over the Green Bay Packers, and that is why Dalvin Cook is our hungriest player of the week. By the way, I just want to give a shout out real quick to Into the AM. We're going to talk a little bit about them in uh, later on in the podcast, but this shirt that they got for me is uh, very comfy, and I'm I love it. So we're going to discuss a little bit about them and what they're about later on in the podcast. 
But starting off with the topics that we have for this show, Carson Wentz. I, I, I have a confession. I have a confession. I was wrong about Carson Wentz. The good player, great player, above average quarterback in the NFL. But I thought that this season was going to be a season where he gets back to his MVP status that he was at in 2017, or at least play like he was somewhat close to reaching that level. And then after I watched that Sunday night game against the Dallas Cowboys, watched it in full, went back and watched some of the plays that he made, I I don't think he's capable of going back to that MVP status like he was in 2017 something has to happen something has to prove me wrong in order for that to for me to change my my mind on that but I believe that Carson Wentz at this point very good player good quarterback talented I love him and I don't think at any point he should be benched that's no I'm not saying he should be benched for Jalen Hurts I'm saying he's not gonna be one of the elite quarterbacks this season maybe even next season maybe even maybe for his whole entire career and I'll explain that in, in in a little bit right here. For a second, I thought it was because of the lack of talent on that Philadelphia Eagles team. You saw the injuries that they had. Lane Johnson, one of the best offensive linemen, was hurt. Then he had the injuries after injury after injury to the wide receivers. Deshaun Jackson just got injured twice. So he's going to be out for the rest of the year, which we presume not until playoff time. If they were to make it, that is. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey is still dealing with an injury that he had last season or that he suffered in, in the offseason, and now he still hasn't made a season debut. Uh, Jalen Rager was in the game for, or in the season for a couple games, was out for a torn UCL, came back, and he scored a touchdown. He looks promising, but then, then you got the injuries to Zach Ertz, then you got Dallas Goddard trying to make a, a name for himself coming back from an injury. So I, I, I thought for a second it was because of the injuries. And in this game against the Dallas Cowboys, they didn't have all their players. I understand. But I really wanted to analyze. I wanted to, to, to really look back because I, w- I was watching that game against the Dallas Cowboys and I thought to myself, Carson Wentz really does not look that good. There has to be, something has to be wrong here. What's going on with Carson Wentz? So I went back courtesy of NFL Game Pass, went back and watched all the plays that Carson Wentz made. And what I noticed when I was watching those plays was that he was making some pretty bad decisions. It looked like as if Carson Wentz was trying to put the team on his back and do way too much to make up for his team not having much. And I'll explain that in a sec. By the way, I'm no NFL scout. I'm not. Okay, so this is just what my eyes tell me just from being a fan of the NFL for so long, for uh, over a decade and watching game after game every single Sunday. I, I, I try to watch every single game, but this is just what my eyes tell me. So Carson Wentz, let me break down some some plays that he had, some mistakes that he had. There was a fumble call, caused by Leighton Vander Esch, the Cowboys linebacker, in the uh, second quarter. That was not his fault. That was just bad protect, protection by the offensive line. But in the first quarter, there was another fumble that Carson Wentz gave up, and that was completely his fault. I don't know if you guys watched that game or remember this play, but it was a play when it was, I believe, second and long, second and 16, something around that nature. He had a lot of time in the pocket, and I get it. It was a coverage sack, good good defense by the Dallas Cowboys. But instead of throwing the ball away and just giving your team another chance on an extra third and long uh, down, he rolled out of the pocket to his left, away from the opposite throwing hand, tried to get some more room, some more time, got rolled out of the pocket, not his biggest strength. And instead of throwing the ball away, even when you're outside of the pocket to save the play, he decided to try to heave the ball, try to make a play happen. And while he did that, he got sacked in the process. Okay, that's fine. He got sacked in the process. But if he tried to heave the ball to the player, Sacked in the process. When he hit the when he hit the ground, before he hit the ground, he gave up the ball. Poor ball protection by Carson Wentz in that instance, and big mental mistakes that Wentz, you know, would love to have that play back. And that was completely his fault. That turnover was his fault. Giving up that ball, giving up the turnover on that fumble and that sack when he could have thrown the ball away. A couple of interceptions that he had in that game, both by Trayvon Diggs. 
the the brother of Stefan Diggs. There was an interception where he was uh, throwing it to Hightower on a deep pass. Hightower was kind of running towards the right side of the field. Carson Wentz did a poor job of leading his receiver in the direction that he was heading. Instead, while he was trying to hit the uh, or, or roll out to the right side of the field, Carson Wentz just threw it straight up, straight in that direction, not towards the right, but straight. And that caused the uh, high tower to readjust, try to make a play. And at that point, he was just underneath the ball. Uh, but Trayvon Diggs had a, a step ahead of him, and he was able to intercept that. That interception was Wentz's fault. Another interception. This was targeted to Jalen Rager in the red zone. Trayvon Diggs made another interception. But this one, again, rolling out to the right, throwing towards the right. You had Jalen Rager open, was boxing out Trayvon Diggs. Just had to be accurate with that pass, roll out to the right, throw that pass, throw an interception. Instead, threw a little bit out of the reach of Jalen Rager and into the hands of Trayvon Diggs, who was past Jalen Rager, and it was an interception. Another interception that was Carson Wentz's fault. So I, I'm bringing this up because I really, in my head, I, I, I thought for the longest time, it's because of the lack of talent. It's because of the receivers not being that great, because of maybe those plays were mis- miscommunication. Maybe they're just not on the same page. I don't know. But from what I was seeing in that Sunday night game and what I could tell was that it was Carson Wentz who was underperforming in that game. So what does that mean? First off, if you play fantasy football and you have Carson Wentz on your team, that does not mean that you need to bench him and that you need to drop him. Not saying that at all. I still believe that he's capable in some games, if the matchup is is right, of putting up 20 or more fantasy points. I believe there was a string of, before the Dallas Cowboys game, there was a string of five games where he had over, or he was averaging 23 fantasy points a game. Don't give up on Carson Wentz and fantasy football. But I believe, like I said earlier, that Wentz is trying to make up for the lack of talent on this team by doing way too much. And it's just a matter of Wentz. Just just ease it. You're a great talent. You're, you're, you're amazing. We drafted, drafted you first round, pick two in 2016 because of your talent level. We know that you can get it done. Just ease back just a bit. You don't have to do way too much. That sack and that fumble on second and 16, you were trying to do way too much when you could just throw the ball away. Give your team another chance. So he is trying to make up for uh, the the lack of talent on that Eagles team. However, the question is, do we believe that he's going to get back to that MVP season or that level that he was at in 2017? At this point, if I had to pick a yes or a no, it's going to be a no. And that pains me to say it because, number one, I love Carson Wentz, and I want him to succeed. And number two, I believe he was going to. And this just, I'm out here saying that I was wrong about that. I really do. So above average quarterback, yeah, he's going to have some seasons where he's going to be a top 10 quarterback and he's the best choice for the Philadelphia Eagles and he can lead them to at least a Super Bowl. But as far as winning another MVP award and being in the likes of the conversation of people like Russell Wilson or Patrick Mahomes or uh, Tom Brady or Drew Brees or any of those good quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers in that conversation, I don't know. I think it's a a, a tier or two down from those players. So definitely interact with us and let me know your thoughts on Carson Wentz. We're going to get into our midseason awards in just a bit. But first, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Into the AM hooked me up with this t-shirt right here. So what exactly is that? Into the AM is a men's clothing brand based in SoCal making elevated everyday apparel targeting the guy that is always hustling creating and grinding to make his life better the shirt that i'm currently wearing is from into the am so they hooked me up they hit me up said hassan would you like to have a partnership opportunity would you like to talk about into the am on your show so at first before you know if any partners or sponsors hit me up i like to do a little bit of research try to get an idea of like okay am i okay with getting my name attached to this company so I looked at their website, and man, oh man, it was a no-brainer at that point. I, I love their products. I love their t-shirts. I love their clothing. They sent me some stuff over. Um, they sent me this navy blue t-shirt right here. Uh, what I love about it is 
the uh, sleeves, it's nice and, and, and tight, but also at any point, if I were to get any gains and my biceps were to, were to grow, uh, you know, inject some steroids or whatever, then it would be stretchy enough for it to, uh, you know, increase and it's slow, it, it's smooth, it's it, it's not tight, it's it's very stretchy and it's very breathable at that point as well. Also, on top of that, they also hooked me up with some pretty cool stickers. I mean, come on, this is a pineapple wearing sunglasses. That's hilarious. That's freaking hilarious, man. And what else we got? We got an astronaut holding a, a, a globe in Earth, man. Uh, you know, the Civil War is about to happen with all the presidential stuff in the election. But this astronaut, you know, for the time being is holding up the the, the world while it's uh, still intact. So uh, into the AM, they also hooked me up with another black T-shirt and an orange T-shirt. And I love their apparel. The sleeves are fitted and hug tight enough to make you look jacked, but it is also loose and stretchy enough for your comfort. Like I said, this is for the men who are hustlers, those entrepreneurs, those content creators. Be sure to click the link in the description of this podcast to check out their website, www.intotheam.com. Very great company. Now we're going to get into the midseason awards. We're at the midpoint of the NFL season, of the 2020 season. So we got to discuss who is on track and who's on pace of winning these awards that they award every single year, such as Most Valuable Player, Offensive Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Comeback Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, and so many more. Let's start off with the most important, probably the one that everybody wants to know. Who is going to be the NFL MVP? And at this point, it's a no-brainer. It's Russell Wilson, quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, on a different level. You know, you could talk about his stats, which we will right now. 26 passing touchdowns, 71.5% of his passes completed. Sounds pretty freaking awesome, doesn't it? Well, if you look at his uh, stats on pace, what he's on pace to put up for the 2020 season, 4,900 yards passing, 59 passing touchdowns, which would be an NFL record. And on pace for 12 interceptions, but that's not that bad if you put up 59 passing touchdowns. He's carrying his team, and he's doing a wonderful job with the Seattle Seahawks, keeping them in close games. Their defense, everybody knows if you're a fantasy football fan, start your offensive players against that defense. That defense is pretty weak. He is keeping the Seattle Seahawks in the game with a winning record, able to put up clutch touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. Russell Wilson is the most valuable player, and if you took him away from that that team, from that Seahawks team, no doubt in my mind they would have a losing record. So Wilson is the beneficiary of uh, a, a great offense, or he is the person that is creating a great offense, and all of his players and all of his defense are the beneficiaries of a great team and of a great record because of Russell Wilson. So Russell Wilson, no doubt about it, is the NFL MVP. By the way, if you're chatting with us and at any point you have any other uh, uh, opinion or any other honorable mentions or any other thoughts on who is going to be the winners of these awards, leave your comments down below. Interact with us because I have some honorable mentions. It could be Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is having a very good season. It could be Patrick Mahomes. Very good season as well, like he does every single year. It could be Derrick Henry. Not a lot of people are talking about him, but Derrick Henry is carrying the load for that Tennessee Titans offense and is complementing very well with Ryan Tannehill. Who Tannehill, you know, he's doing a great job as well, but Derrick Henry is obviously the best player on that Titans team. So a lot of MVP candidates uh, this season. Moving on to another uh, award, the Offensive Player of the Year. Okay, so this is what I don't understand. I don't understand why whoever wins MVP, more than likely, most of the time, it's an offensive player. Why doesn't this player win the Offensive Player of the Year? If they're the most valuable player in the NFL out of offense and defense, doesn't that mean that they're the best offensive player? Somehow, some way, it, it, the NFL just doesn't reward the NFL MVP, the Offensive Player of the Year award as well. I mean, sometimes they do. I, I believe Patrick Mahomes, if someone could fact check, fact check that for me, I believe Patrick Mahomes won the MVP award and the Offensive Player of the Year. But uh, 
it, in my eyes, if MVP is Russell Wilson, it should be Russell Wilson, the offensive player of the year. But if it's not, how the NFL likes to do the thing, give it to another offensive player, then let's just give it to Alvin Kamara, the second best offensive player in my eyes this season. If you want to talk about his stats right now, 55 receptions. Let me say that again. 55 receptions for the NFL season through seven games for a running back. He's on pace to put up, ladies and gentlemen, 125 receptions for a running back. And he, that, that's numbers that's great for a wide receiver. But if you talk about a, a running back having that, that's great and all. That's amazing. But on top of that, the work that he does on that ground, on in the ground game, remarkable for the Saints. Seven total touchdowns so far and over 1,000 yards from scrimmage. So he's on pace of putting up 126 receptions, like we mentioned, 125, 126 in between there. Over 2,200 yards from scrimmage total, receiving and rushing. Alvin Kamara is on pace to have. And 16 total touchdowns. That sounds like the video game numbers for me. So Alvin Kamara, absolutely the best player on that Saints team and the second offensive player in the NFL behind Russell Wilson, in my opinion. So, honorable mentions for this Offensive Player of the Year award. You could have Patrick Mahomes winning this award. You could have Aaron Rodgers, like we mentioned, with the MVP. You could have Derrick Henry, like we mentioned, with the MVP. Same thing. These people could be MVP candidates, but they're also Offensive Player of the Year candidates as well. So, uh, Alvin Kamara would be our choice for Offensive Player of the Year. Defensive Player of the Year. A lot of names to talk about. There's a lot of players out there that are having some pretty good seasons. I'm going to go ahead and lean more so towards the side of the stats, towards the stat sheet, because it is a big margin between this player and other honorable mentions we're going to mention in just a bit. But Miles Garrett, defensive end for the Cleveland Browns. The reason I have him as a defensive player of the year is because, number one, nine sacks for the NFL season through eight games pretty good he's on pace of getting 18 sacks for the whole year he's a monster on that defensive line and has made an impact on the turnover game as well four forced fumbles for the Cleveland Browns he's on pace of having eight forced fumbles for the 2020 season is that gonna happen probably not but if you want to play this game and play the pace game eight forced fumbles 18 sacks he's on pace Miles Garrett is honorable mentions that we have for a uh, defensive player of the year TJ Watt is playing lights out for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the lifeline of that Pittsburgh Steelers defense. The best defense in the NFL without question. TJ Watt should be deserving of some Defensive Player of the Year votes. And as always, every single year, Aaron Donald. You cannot have a Defensive Player of the Year running without mentioning Aaron Donald's name, who's won that award multiple times in his dominant year after year. So, Leave your opinions. Do you believe that it should be Miles Garrett? Or, you know, I don't blame you if you were to say TJ Watt. I had a hard time with this. I would have leaned, I, I leaned towards Miles Garrett, but I understand if you lean more so towards TJ Watt. But leave your opinions uh, in the chat and, and interact with us. Next up, the rookies. You got Offensive Rookie of the Year and Defensive Rookie of the Year. Who is going to run away with these awards? You've got Joe Burrow playing lights out. You've got. Justin Herbert doing a very good job as well. I'm going to give the Offensive Rookie of the Year to Justin Herbert. And here's why. The honorable mention is Joe Burrow of the Cincinnati Bengals. Great season. Doing a very good job. He's thrown 330 pass attempts so far this season at the halfway point. He's on pace of throwing for 700 passing attempts. So that, that that's... Remarkable. That's great. He passes the ball a lot. But the thing is, he's thrown 11 touchdowns in those 330 pass attempts. Meaning in 700 attempts, he's going to throw for 22 touchdowns. Whereas Justin Herbert has a lot less pass attempts because he has only played six games this season. Tyrod Taylor was a starter at the beginning of the year. Justin Herbert has much less pass attempts and has thrown for many more touchdowns on those pass attempts. So he's done much more with his passing attempts than Joe Burrow. And that's why I believe he should be Offensive Rookie of the Year. 18 passing touchdowns so far this season. Five interceptions thrown, 1,800 yards passing. Okay, that's great. 
right? He's not going to play a full 18-game schedule or a 16-game schedule. But if he were on pace of playing 16 games, he would have thrown for 48 touchdowns and 4,800 yards. Forget that breaking rookie records, which he's going to do. That's MVP numbers right there. 48 passing touchdowns on 4,800 passing yards. So Herbert, mm, remarkable. He's going to be a great player in the uh, NFL for years to come. That's why I have him winning the Offensive Rookie of the Year award. Defensive Rookie of the Year. I kind of went back and forth on this. There's three main players that I really want to talk about. Chase Young, I think. If I had to say what I believe is going to happen, I believe that Chase Young is going to win the NFL Defensive Rookie of the Year award. Just because if I know the NFL, if I know the voters, and if I know how their thinking is, I believe that they're going to vote the guy that has made an impact on the on the Washington football team. Don't get me wrong, he has. But is also touted as a very good player, has been touted as a first-round talent, has been a top-five pick. They're going to pick Chase Young just because of the name value, just because of how great he's been playing. But if I had to pick someone that's a little bit more underrated and has a better better impact on their team, in my eyes, I believe, on that defense, you guys are probably going to laugh at me. But I believe that Antoine Winfield Jr., the defensive back of the Buccaneers, has a shot of winning the Defensive Rookie of the Year award. His stats... Not that flashy, okay? Only one interception this season. But again, your eyes, they don't deceive you. The eye test will tell you that the Tampa Bay secondary, although it could use some help, the main bright spot for that team is their rookie that they drafted in the second round. Antoine Winfield Jr., the son of Antoine Winfield, who also played in the NFL with Antoine Winfield Jr.'s teammate, or against his teammate, Tom Brady. So Winfield Jr. only one interception this season, but I believe that the point the point is that he makes the bigger impact on his team and it helps the Buccaneers win some close games. That's the reason why he should be considered for the Defensive Rookie of the Year. The most recent example is that two-point conversion against the New York Giants that he had against uh, Monday night, or that he was defending against Deion Lewis. He was the main man and the main reason why the Giants did not tie that game and why it did not go into overtime because of Antoine Winfield Jr. and his defense. So I believe that he should be Defensive Rookie of the Year. Again, some honorable mentions. Chase Young is also in the running. So if he wins the uh, the Rookie Award, it's not that big of a deal. Also, Patrick Queen, the rookie linebacker, has 48 tackles for the Baltimore Ravens for that stout defense. It is a little bit underneath the radar, uh, the first-round linebacker that they drafted this past season. Uh, could also be a candidate for that Defensive Rookie of the Year award. So Patrick Queen, Chase Young, and Antoine Winfield Jr. are my choices. Got two more. We got Coach of the Year and Comeback Player of the Year. Let's start with the Coach of the Year. Mike Tomlin is long overdue. Long overdue for this award. At this point, having one of the best seasons, if not the best season of his career... Mike Tomlin, in my eyes, should be the coach of the year. 7-0 start to the season. Long overdue, like I said. He deserved this award years and years ago. What Tomlin does is he adapts with the team that he has, and he's able to help his team pick up some victories. If you look at last season, when they lost Ben Roethlisberger, you could have easily said that Tomlin and the Pittsburgh Steelers should have had a losing record in that season. But instead... He was able to play, uh, play to his players' strengths, was able to put in Mason Rudolph, Devlin Hodges, pick up some victories, and finish with an 8-8 eight and eight, eight, eight and eight record. So uh, he's never had a losing season in his career. Think about that. Has been the head coach of the Steelers since 2008. Has never had a losing season. Has been 8-8 eight and eight a couple of times, but that's the worst season that he's had. So one of the best coaches in the NFL has never won the Coach of the Year award Mike Tomlin is long overdue for that. Some honorable mentions that we have. I only have one, really. Some honorable mention. Uh, an honorable mention for this uh, award. Brian Flores of the Miami Dolphins. Honorable mention. 
this guy turned this team around. And if you look at the past 16 games that he's played with the Dolphins, he has a 9-7 and record. So he's done a lot with the culture in Miami since Adam Gase left. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big thing to turn around when Adam Gase messes up your team. So Brian Flores has done a very good job. And it, this Dolphins team is 4-3. and three. They were going into the season thinking like, hey, this is going to be another rebuilding year. Let's give Tua some reps, get him some, uh, you know, adjusted to the NFL and, and the game speed and all that. But he's done a very good job with this offense, with Ryan Fitzpatrick for the first half of the season, with this defense playing like they are a very decent defense in the NFL, having some pretty good defensive backs and a pretty good front seven as well. So Brian Flores has done a very good job. Mike Tomlin and Brian Flores would be my candidates for the coach of the year. And the last one, the comeback player of the year. It's a feel-good story. Alex Smith of the Washington football team. Just because of the story that he has. And that's really it, just because of uh, the injury that he suffered in 2018 with his football career and being in doubt with his life hanging on the line. Alex Smith stepped up, recovered, surgery after surgery after surgery, infection after infection, was able to come back and come back onto the field and play a few snaps on top of that. So Smith, I, I believe he should be the comeback player of the year. And it's really because, uh, yeah, yeah, the story that he has is, is remarkable. Forget the stats that he puts up. Forget that, uh, you know, he may only play one, two, maybe three games this year. Toward, maybe towards the tail end of the season, he might. Forget that, okay? Th- this isn't about putting up a lot of stats or, or, you know, helping his team, co- you know, pick up a few victories. It's about him and what he o- overcame so that he could continue his football career uh, the number one overall pick from 2005 is still playing in the NFL, is defying the, the defying his age, defying the injuries, and he's still able to put up uh, or, or come back for his team and come back onto that field. That story is remarkable, yes, but also there's really not that many comeback player candidates out there. I mean... Before the season started, a lot of people were talking about maybe Cam Newton being a candidate for this Comeback Player of the Year award. I mean, the judging by the way that's turning out, two and five record and not throwing a touchdown in the last three games, uh, it, it's not looking like it's going to be Cam Newton. Maybe if he turns it around, maybe if he improves and somehow, some way, the Patriots have a shot of making the playoffs and he puts up some pretty good numbers, then yeah, maybe Cam Newton could be Comeback Player of the Year. But at this point, I feel like that they're going to go, the NFL voters at least are going to go with a feel-good story, and they're going to go with Alex Smith, which deservingly so. He should be deserving that award, not taking anything away from that. But those are our mid-season awards, but chat with us. I'm going to be chatting with you guys as well. Who do you guys believe are going to win these awards? Do you agree with me or do you disagree? Definitely chat. Let's have a discussion, and uh, I would love to hear your opinions and hear your thoughts. Now for everyone's favorite part of the show, the fantasy football Q&A. I pick a a few comments, a few questions that you guys leave in those fantasy football starts and sets videos every single week. Also those waiver wire ads and drops videos as well. And I just answer them here on air. So uh, this may apply to you if you have any one of these players. This is a good insight for you guys. And uh, definitely if you're still interacting with us in the chat, if you have other questions besides any of these questions or any of these players I'm going to mention, keep interacting with us. I'll try my absolute best to, to respond to you guys, to get back to you guys. As hopefully the chat's not overblowing with uh, with Asian bots. Oh my gosh. I, you know, those Asian bots in those comments, I thought they were gone. They still exist. Is this, I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, besides those Asian bots, we have real people leaving comments with real questions, which I'm going to be answering right here. Starting off with our first one, YouTuber Eduardo Castro. Justin Jackson or Ronald Jones? Ronald Jones is on the decline. I hate to say it. He's still a very good player, still worthy of a, of a stash. And yeah, it could be a flex play here and there, but it's Leonard Fournette's team at this point, and it's just going to be trending up in his direction. Just because of the talent level that Fournette has, he's way more talented than Ronald Jones. And Bruce Arians has said that this, in the beginning of the season, this is Ronald Jones' job until it's not. And in the past two weeks, it has been proven 
that it's no longer Ronald Jones and his job. So Leonard Fournette is the starting running back, in my eyes, I believe, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Jones is going to come in and get 10 to 15 touches. Yeah, that's awesome. But Ronald Jones, just so you know, just so everyone knows, if you own Ronald Jones in fantasy football, he's on the decline. I mentioned that because in this question, Justin Jackson or Ronald Jones, I'm going to go with Justin Jackson. Okay, The number one back in LA is going to have a sizable role even when Austin Eckler comes back. Troy Mayne Pope, out of nowhere. Cool. Maybe it was a one-week thing. Josh Kelly, at this point, just drop him. Drop him. Not worth the the, the, the stash. Is only played on, I believe, 29% of snaps, while Justin Jackson was playing on 41% of snaps last week. He's the number one back. Uh, got 17 carries for 89 yards. So Justin Jackson over Ronald Jones any day of the week. Next one is from Jacob Chong. Should I trade Singletary and Sterling Shepard for Zeke? 100% absolutely Yes, Zeke has had a string of three bad games, and now a doubt is in the heads of fantasy owners that have Zeke saying, oh my gosh, what's happening? He's had three bad games. He had a game where he had two fumbles against the Arizona Cardinals. Tony Pollard has come in. He got 10 carries in one game, eight carries in another, seven touches in another. Zeke is on the decline. Jump on it, man. Jump on it. Take advantage of that. This is the week because Zeke is going to pop off eventually and go back to his Ezekiel Elliott ways because the Dallas Cowboys would be dumb to bench Zeke or at least give him a less of a workload in the favor of Tony Pollard because Ezekiel Elliott is Ezekiel Elliott. And Devin Singletary, if last week told us anything, is on the decline because of the game that he had uh, or he was split in touches with Zach Moss. Now, Singletary was on the field more. And the first offensive, I believe the four or five plays, first offensive plays of that game with the Buffalo Bills last week were touches to Devin Singletary. Four carries on the ground and the one reception. So Singletary is still going to be in the game plan. I understand. It's not going to be all Zach Moss's team. It could be later in the season, maybe in two or three weeks, and Singletary is just, his role just decreases, but I don't see that happening. Instead, he's going to continuously split touches, and he's only going to get 10 to 15 carries and he's only going to get so many points for this team. Zeke, on the other hand, can get you 20 fantasy points a game. And Sterling Shepard, yeah, he's a wa- he's a waiver wire pickup. Good receiver. The best receiver in New York, in my eyes. But you can make up for that. There's a lot of other wide receivers you can stream here and there. So, Singletary and Sterling Shepard for Zeke, yes, 100%. Absolutely jump on that. Next one. Thicky Nicky. What a name. Gurley and Rojo, is it Rojo or Rojo? I'm going to say Rojo because of Ronald Jones, not Hones, Honus. For Derrick Henry, yes. Do it, man. Do it. Okay, I don't know what's going on with Todd Gurley. I don't know if it's his knee. I don't know if the Falcons are being cautious. But Brian Hill had 11 carries last week against the Carolina Panthers. Gurley had 18. I get it. But it's not going to be often that the, the Falcons are in the game uh, or up by a big lead a lot until they blow it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what they do. But it's not going to have happen a lot where they have a big lead and they're going to maintain that big lead or they're just going to have a big lead the whole entire game. It's going to be a lot of, hey, this defense is not that great for the Falcons. So the other opposing team is going to score a lot. So the Falcons have to make up with that with their passing attack, back and forth, back and forth. So Gurley is not going to get 18 carries every single week if we factor in the amount of touches that Brian Hill had this past week against the Carolina Panthers. For Rojo, we just explained on the decline, Leonard Fournette is the starting running back. Yeah, Rojo could be a flex play here and there. He could be a good add for the bench and a good stash. But if you want to talk about firepower, You want to talk about a guy that could get you consistent 20 to 25 25 fantasy points every single week. A cornerstone running back one that you can build your team around. That's going to be Derrick Henry. Give up Todd Gurley and Ronald Jones, two running backs. If you have running back depth to do that, yeah, do it. Increase your team. Build your roster. Better your roster. Because in five weeks, it's going to be... It's going to be fantasy football playoff time, and you want to have the best of the best on your team. So Derrick Henry is the way to go. Next one is from TT. If I had to drop one, should I drop Boston Scott or Giovanni Bernard? 
So both Joe Mixon and Miles Sanders are expected to come back next week. So their roles are going to be diminished. But Boston Scott's role is going to be more diminished than Gio Bernard, if that makes any sense. If that makes any sense. Boston Scott and the games that he substituted for Miles Sanders did his job in one week against the Giants. Did wonderful and was the reason why they won. Last week against the Dallas Cowboys was not looking that great. So, uh, or at least was not given that many opportunities. He looked great, but the final stat line was that he was not given that many opportunities. Gio Bernard, on the other hand, even when Joe Mixon was in the game, was healthy, he was still getting touches. He was still getting a, a, a good, healthy amount of work. So if you are an owner of Joe Mixon and you want to keep a handcuff, uh, or if you had to choose between Boston Scott or Gio Bernard, who to keep, it's going to be Gio Bernard. He's been looking good in the past two weeks for as far as fantasy football goes. He's going to continue to look great. So Gio Bernard is my answer. Next one from JVid19. Defensive special teams, Cardinals or Washington this week? Cardinals face Miami with a rookie quarterback. Yeah, that is, that's a pretty good stream. Yeah, with uh, Miles Gaskin hurt, put on IR with Matt Breida even hurt with a hamstring injury. Your running game is hurt. Your quarterback position, we still don't know a lot about Tua Tagovailoa yet. Cardinals are a good stream, but if I had to put my money on one of those two, I'm going to say Washington just because of the matchup that they have against the New York Giants. Okay, so we already know that the Giants offense is in shambles. Uh, they have some good pieces here and there. Daniel Jones, if it's based off of last week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, maybe he's turning it around. But we know that they've lost their best player. We know that they've lost their uh, backup running back that they signed in Devontae Freeman, that this running back position is uh, is a little bit weak. We know that Daniel Jones leads the NFL in turnovers. You know, interesting stat, by the way, I want to mention. Uh, in the amount of games that Daniel Jones has played in the NFL throughout his whole entire career, he has more turnovers than Jamarcus Russell at this point in his career. But you didn't know that. That's that's because uh, we, we talk about Russell being a big bust just because the expectation on him was the number one overall pick, had higher expectations than Daniel Jones. But Daniel Jones is a turnover machine, and this Washington football team is great on defense. Their front seven, that defensive line, filled with a lot of first-round talent. So I would start Washington this week. They're ranked first in the NFL against the pass, allowing the fewest passing yards a game. Guess what? Daniel Jones and that passing attack could use a little bit of help. So that's my reasoning behind starting Washington this week. Also not to mention that you got Chase Young, who can sack the quarterback in that offensive line. Needs a lot of help. Uh, let's do a couple more. Let's do this one from T Lang 22 do I start Janu or Tanyan? So Jonu Smith or Robert Tanyan at the tight end position? Well, T Lang 22, I know that you got a Tennessee Titans avatar, and I'm going to give you some good news. I'm going to say Jonu Smith, uh, the tight end of your team. Uh, against Chicago, this is just the better matchup, and uh, Jonu Smith was a top five tight end at one point this season. Even after having a, a bad game, scoring only two fantasy points uh, a couple of weeks ago, so... Uh, a top five talent, Ryan Tannehill. I know that Corey Davis is healthy. I know that Corey Davis is his second option. And John Smith is just the third option. But I'm going to say that John Smith is the better option and can still put up bigger numbers and is more athletic and is a, more of a beast than Robert Tanyan, uh, who plays against the San Francisco 49ers, who don't have that bad of a defense. So if I had to pick between John Smith or Robert Tanyan, I'm going to go ahead and pick Jonu Smith. Not saying that, you know, the Titans aren't facing a bad defense as well. They're a very good defense. Chicago is, but uh, as far as tight ends go, as far as stopping tight ends, Jonu Smith uh, has a better matchup. This last one is from Vanessa Sable. Oh, man, what an iconic last name in the NFL community. Which two would you start out of these three? Mike Evans, Antonio Brown, and Chase Claypool. The answer is Mike Evans. Still go with that wide receiver one. I know that Chase Claypool is trending towards being a wide receiver one. Um, Antonio Brown actually is not that bad of a play. I, I, I haven't heard or read any articles or watched any videos of people saying that he's anything less than a flex play this week. So I would start Antonio Brown with confidence if you can, if you need someone in your flex position. 
But if you're choosing between talent and opportunities and uh, who's more, more consistent and more the trusted target of their quarterback, uh, I'm going to choose Mike Evans out of those three. So good matchup against the Saints as well. But that brings us to the end of our podcast, of our show this Thursday. So I appreciate you guys sticking up with us throughout this whole entire chat, uh, throughout this whole show. If you guys are listening to us on the audio experience on the podcast app, just know that we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash time to football. Subscribe to us on there. Vice versa, you can head on over to the podcast app. Listen to us on the go. Uh, It's much more convenient that way instead of uh, listening to us live. But the benefit of watching us live on YouTube every Thursday as a pregame show is that you get to chat with us before the game, get you guys ready for that game, and get you ready for the week. Uh, for fantasy football and ask your fantasy football questions. So I appreciate you guys joining us for the chat. It is week nine of the 2020 NFL season, and Adam Gase is still the head coach of the New York Jets. Enjoy the game, and I'll see you next week.